Hi, this is Paul. I don't have time to give the Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein piece on Brett's channel, the full treatment right now, but I'm going to read some of the tweets that I had this morning, which sort of give a sense of where I'm going with this, and then this is going to be the beginning of a extended version I will probably post tomorrow where I go into some of the clips and some of those things. I can't listen to Brett Weinstein speak to Jordan Peterson without hearing Brett as Gnostic. This I get from Sam, and I'll play that in the longer version. It's all genes until we transcend our code, and I have the secret path to transcend the evil demiurge behind the genetic spelling bee. Brett Weinstein says to Jordan Peterson, We can no longer afford to be unaware of the evil, but dim genocidal machinations of the agenda of the genes, because now... We have the capacity to destroy not just a small community, but all of humanity. This is what Brett says again and again, and this is very much at the heart of his, his meaningful mission. But he doesn't notice is that the astounding good fortune that we, at the same time, have evolved the enlightening to unveil the evil genetic genocidal impersonal unconscious conspiracy to avoid our destruction. That's one hell of a fortuitous timing scenario in this cosmic zero-day attack, especially because no one planned it and there's no script it was even following. Now let's pull together to thwart this zero-day attack just for the found, um, from the foundations of the earth, metaphorically speaking. Look, I just happen to have our salvation plan right here in my back pocket. Follow me. And then I put in a gif of Arnold as the Terminator. Come with me if you want to live. Come with me if you want to live. Now, of course, Arnold in The Terminator is sort of a good symbolic illustration of what we're talking about here because Arnold in the second Terminator movie was a Terminator captured by his future self, which was rewired and then sent back in time to save the young boy who would lead the revolt. So I think it's a perfect symbolic entry into this this strange way that Brett sees salvation in, as Sam pointed out, a very Gnostic way. So I'm just going to make this quick little video now. I'm going to post it to my channel now. It's just sort of a little teaser, a little short one. And tomorrow morning, I'll post the video that has all of the big stuff in it. Okay, so the teaser was the tweets. I put out that little teaser yesterday, and now you're going to get the main thing. So Brett has been making this point this is sort of his big point. You know, he's spent a lot of time talking about critical theory and, you know, working out all of the stuff that's still in him from the Evergreen chapter. But his big point is that we've got to save ourselves in this particular way. And he rewired Terminator. But see, unlike, unlike the Terminator from the movie who was sent from the future, Brett has rewired himself and it's his mission to awaken the rest of us to the reality of the genocidal spelling bee. And this is how he does it. And he's been making this point again and again. Now, again, I'm not a, I'm not really a critic of Brett. Um, I, I think the guy's brilliant. I, watch his stuff semi-regularly. Uh, he's far smarter than I'll ever be. But what was amazing was when my friend Sam said, Brett is a Gnostic, it was like, bang, it all came together. That was the best way to talk about this. And one of the clearest examples of Brett's main point is here on Rebel Wisdom, an early video on Rebel Wisdom that he basically lays out very clearly how he sees the world. One thing is the fact that we have become an existential threat to ourselves slots in very nicely to the enemy that we face together, mm. right? We've mm. seen the enemy, it is us. Oh. And so that awareness of that can, I believe, trigger the kind of unity that you're talking about. The problem is that narrative, which I believe is true, we have become the existential threat to ourselves, that narrative is in conflict with those who are most powerful in civilization who would like to keep it running as it is because it's feeding them pretty darn well. So that story, even though it should unify us, it happens that there are a few holdouts and they're the most powerful people and they're selling a different story. And also it feels like it... So, so we have to... It's the revolution. It requires a degree of radical self-assessment to say it is us, not to say it is them. 
Right. The natural <laughs> tendency is to see it as them, but it is really, it is us. It is the processes. Well, it is us, but it's really the elites because the elites, it's working for them, so they're going to stay in power. So, But the first step you have to do is sort of awaken to the new secret truth that is being revealed to us and, well, let's let them finish it. That, you know, somehow keep this room temperate. You know, they're fueled by some power station somewhere that has implications. So, you know, it is really us. It's the processes that we are depending on that we don't see day to day, but they're out there. Um, the other thing, and you know, and you, you point to it, uh, I think you called it the psychonaut route into that sort of unity, involves an enlightenment, an awakening to a deep truth. And I, the analogy I use is this. If you discovered that you were a robot and that you were sent to, I don't know, assassinate some person who was innocent, if you discovered that... Like a little boy who's going to lead the future revolution, but the, the Terminator figures out that, oh my goodness, my programming is evil. What evil demiurge programmed me in this with this genocidal spelling bee? That was the explanation for you. You would reject your program, right? Why? You, as the robot that had been given decency in order to get by everybody so you could commit your assassination, would say, actually, I prioritize the values and I reject the mission that I've been sent on. That's who we are. We are that robot. We are on a genetic mission that is absolutely unacceptable. How would, you just, how would you just succinctly define that genetic mission? That genetic mission is... Just propagation at all costs? Propagation of your particular genetic spellings. And here's the key. It's a little subtle, but if you and I have different spellings for a particular, let's say, a respiratory enzyme, and let's say that respiratory enzyme functions better in you than in me. It's 10% more efficient. My respiratory enzyme still wants your respiratory enzyme to go extinct because it doesn't care about the function. It cares that that spelling is advanced. And your Now, all that wanting is metaphorical truth for Brett, okay? That's really important because all of these systems that create some sort of agency that is around us that we can't seem to escape, such as the agency that's being expressed in the elites that are, that are with, that are, just sort of denying the revolution that needs to take place in order to save the planet. Well, that's all metaphorical truth. Spelling is in conflict with my spelling. As long as yours is around, there will be fewer copies of mine. So our genomes are actually interested. I mean, the, if I can just be clear about it, the mind fuck of the whole thing <laughs> is that the entire evolutionary story is the cosmic spelling bee and it ends in genocide. Right. Once you realize that that's what you are, that you're built to advance your genetic spellings into the future generations, irrespective of what they spell, and that under circumstances like these, we can afford to be decent to each other, but if things were different, one of us would be putting the other in a gas chamber, no way. I want no part of that, and neither do you. So when people realize that that's really what they are, they are built to be nice when it makes sense to be nice, and they're built to be genocidal in circumstances when genocide is the thing, then the question is, well, all of the things that you actually value, how consistent are they with being that robot on that mission? So it sounds like you are sort of saying, at our root, we are nasty, brutish, and short, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the, the old selfish gene kind of thing, compared to some ascensionist or triumphalist. Clearly, you know, it's very prevalent in the self-help popular psychology space. We are on the frothy edge of, of, of realizing our true natures as you know, spiritual beings, blah, blah, blah. Um, is that something you don't hold out hope for, you feel like at root we are just self-oriented robot programs? Is what, what's, what's our shot at redemption? Do oh, we have one? I, it's easier. It's easier than you would think because the fact is... I'm it's easier than you would think? And again, I, when he says that, it's like, do you remember what you just said before Jamie Wheel asked the question? <laughs> and this is a guy who has a career of basically explaining our hate behavior because of unseen programming within us. But, and, and so all of us are working out those unseen programs, but he somehow 
stands above it and transcends it because he has the secret knowledge. And that secret knowledge means all of that programming doesn't apply to him. And it doesn't apply to you too if you only take the, if you, if you only do the simple thing. I'm telling you, we are that robot on that mission. Once you know that that's your mission, you could just reject it. Right? I'm not, I'm not putting anybody in a gas chamber. I just won't do it. Right? I don't care about the genetic spelling. But he just finished saying, this all works while we're here right and good right now, but if things really get bad, one of us will be putting the other in a gas chamber. He just said those words. And now he's saying, I won't put you in a gas chamber. Oh, but you just finished saying that if things weren't so good, one of us would put... So how do you know? where your limits are. And see, this is where, when he talks to Jordan Peterson, it's so interesting because Peterson on one hand wants with, you know, like Matt Ridley and some of these others, and this, this, this he and Peterson will get into in the video, Peterson on one hand will say, I'm optimistic about the future. Peterson on the other hand has even a more deeply, darkly Augustinian idea of human nature than this assassin robot. The assassin robot can just, oh, I'm an assassin robot. I won't be that. You know, Rousseau is haunting this man, and he doesn't know it. At all. And I really don't. If I discovered that my sons were switched in the hospital at birth and they were not actually related to me, it doesn't change my relationship to them. It doesn't affect whether I love them. I don't love them because of their genetic spellings. So my point... And, and this is where, in a very strange way, and this is so true of our, our very mixed, flowing river. So Peterson, in a sense, with his Augustinian anthropology, is optimistic about the future. And Weinstein has this Terminator anthropology that just says, one of those Terminators, as they're blasting away the humans in the future, stops and says, this isn't right. point is, we are actually, evolution screwed up. It handed us the tools to recognize that we don't have to value the game that it is playing and that we can now repurpose the hardware to something that's actually worthwhile. And it's just a coincidence that this would happen in the time when we are just brimming with affluence, food, the, the kinds of things that we compete against, against uh, compete against each other again. His main point is a terrific one, that we treat each other this fondly because we're not competing. But put us in a zero-sum game, and we do what we do, which is kill each other. Now, I am a Christian minister, and the astounding thing about Jesus is he goes to the cross, and on the cross he says, Father, forgive them for they don't, for they don't know what they do. In, in a sense... Jesus enacts Brett's program, but it is sort of a it's sort of a Mary Sue redemptive plan that just says, you know, the I don't know, let's say the let's say the killer drone flying over Pakistan or Iraq ready to blow away some terrorists at the command of the men in Kansas in those container units that you see on the movies that have this, those drones suddenly wake up and say, oh, those are people down there. What drone has done this? And so this is where he and Peterson's conversation, in fact, gets interesting. But I want to play I want to play Sam because, you know, I, I was I watched this and I didn't really have the words for it. And then Sam actually messaged me and he says, he's Gnostic. And I thought it was like the light went on. It's like, you're right. That's exactly what this is. And now Sam had a conversation with 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 John Verveke and Sam laid it out and I thought Sam did it perfectly. So I played it in a previous video, but it deserves playing again. In fact, that whole conversation that Sam had with John Verveke was absolutely astounding of an interesting way i so i i saw a, a debate discussion between richard dawkins and brett weinstein one time yeah, this, yeah. back before covid they they were in chicago and I'm, I'm in chicago so i i went and saw that um and i think that so one of so if there's 
So if Christianity and Neoplatonism are close siblings, there's a third sibling in the family of Gnosticism very that much, is, very much, is yeah, also yeah, yeah. interconnected with it. Oh, totally. And, and totally. it's sort of the estranged sibling in many ways. But yes. if, if I could, you know, like Gnosticism would often say that somehow something wrong in the cascade of being happened, yeah, right? Yeah, Either yeah. there was a, a malevolent, a malevolent God, right? It, you know, subordinate to the main God or, or some yeah. God acted in ignorance or, you know, some yep, e yep. either either badness or ignorance or some combination of those things led to where we are now. Right. Yep. Whereas a Neoplatonist would say, no, it's, it's a cascade of goodness, right? Maybe there are degrees of goodness, but there's not a bad step somewhere in the process. And, and, now, some of you watching are going to say, "So what with all this ancient, all this ancient philosophy and religion? What does that have to do with it?" Well, actually, what these ancient philosophies provide is sort of a menu out of which we grow, and these patterns persist. Brett Weinstein might never have imagined himself to be a Gnostic, but here he's in some ways manifesting the pattern. Christianity is actually interesting in that it says, well, the creation process was good, but there's badness in the creation now. Yeah. Right? And, and if you go back to Jonathan Peugeot and Jordan Peterson's conversation, Gnosticism came up and, and Peugeot was exactly right because Peugeot said the thing about Christianity is, is that Christianity says creation is good. And so Brett says, no, it's it's not good. And, and in many ways, this right there is is sort of the heart of a whole lot of post-Christian deconstruction that's going on with people raised Christians. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, 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 it tries to split the difference. Yeah. Right. Very much. Right. So, yeah. the, so there is badness, but it, it wasn't in the cascade or uh, that, that caused us to come into being. It was sort of after that. Right. And, and so what I think is interesting, connecting that idea to Brett Weinstein and a lot of sort of like Sam Harris, I think, will say these sorts of things that that basically evolution is sort of like this malevolent force in in their imagination that ah, that yeah. Brett Weinstein will say evolution is a cosmic spelling bee that ends in genocide or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. that we need to transcend our programming to escape it as if it has this yeah. meta purpose to it that yeah, yeah. is somehow we can recognize as evil from where we're standing now. That's and I, I, I think that it's it's strangely Gnostic, Gnostic. In, yeah. in that totally. kind of way. Totally. And, I think that's brilliant what you're saying. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like he, so we need to transcend our programming. Okay, so I like, how are we doing that? Like the Gnostics at least said, we can hopscotch the bad God to get back to the good God, right? Right, right. Yeah, right. we were made by a bad God, but perhaps our soul or our mind or something is good and, and we need to, yeah. you know, yeah. jump back up the, yeah. The, yeah. the ladder to the good, the good rungs and escape the bad rungs. But it, without anything like that, I don't understand how sort of the, kind of pretty strictly materialistic evolution is a malevolent force that has some, there's yeah. something in it that desires badness. It desires genocide. It desires death. It desires competition. It desires, you know, conquering of the fittest and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Stanovich does something within cognitive psychology, very similar. He talks about the robots rebellion. He's very influenced by uh, uh, Dennett's idea of means um, mm -hmm. and, so, and, and Dawkins selfish gene. Uh, but what I can say again is, is, is biology, you know, cutting edge biology, philosophy of biology is really abandoning those models to a very significant degree. Um, I agree with you. And it sort of reminds me of Jung's idea that the default spirituality of human beings is Gnosticism, mm -hmm. um, because it's a way of projecting a narrative that redeems you from your insignificance and your powerlessness. It gives you a central role. And, and I've tried to, I've, I have a very ambivalent attitude towards Gnosticism because I, uh, I think I agree with Hans Jonas. The Gnostics are sort of sort of like proto existentialists. They're they're talking about how we often find ourselves caught in sort of existential ignorance and existential, uh, you know, uh, inertia. We don't we're stuck. That's a common thing people say when they go into therapy. We're stuck and we don't know how to get unstuck and we don't know who we really are. And 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 and, and so we seek Gnosis. We seek the kind of knowing, uh, you know, part deeply participating in ourselves 
that will heal us from our existential inertia. Our ex- and and what's astounding by Brett, the way Brett lays this out, that, well, you just do it. You just do it. I wouldn't put you in a gas chamber. And, I get, you know, and, and Peterson is the one who uses, uses Auschwitz and says the proper way to tour Auschwitz is to say, this is, people like me did this. And in a set, sense, Brett comes along and says, I would never have done this. And you, you're not getting the point. Existential ignorance. So I'm very interested in Gnosis. And, I, mm-hmm. and I'm interested in the Gnostics because they were, they were creating this mythos that were trying to give expression to that. But I'm also very critical of them because they're sort of like, they're, like you said, it, it's a pervasive temptation of human thought that puts us into the, what Jules Evans calls conspirituality. There's a grand conspiracy, right? And yeah. spirituality is a response to the grand conspiracy. And so I, what I, I really appreciate what you just said. I thought that was really beautiful. Um, and, and first of all, it shows how people like uh, Weinstein and others are deeply, deeply spiritual and even mythopoetic without realizing it. So I, no. congratulations on that. I think that's a very well said thing. I'm going to. It, what's going to be very interesting is is Peterson invited Verveke in for a conversation on Twitter, and that's going to be a very interesting conversation because John is rather skeptical about Peterson's hero's journey as being sort of a central thing, and and of course John's been on the channel plenty of times and and all of all of the angles of this. I, I'm going to play. I'm going to go before the clip I just played because Sam, what Sam lays out here is an argument, which I'd never really heard before, about evolution, telos, and purpose. Now, what, say, John Verveke and Brett Weinstein have in common is that they're ardently opposed to some sort of purposiveness. So the conversation between Jordan and Brett hinges around, so if you listen to that one, after Jordan's conversation with 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 Jonathan Peugeot, Jordan is very much working through these questions of where do the mythos and the physical world connect and how are they related? And just this morning, <laughs> Jordan Peterson tweeted a C.S. Lewis essay. And I, 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 I you'd have to pick me up off my floor. I, I mean, if there was, to, to be perfectly honest, part of why this channel started was I saw Peterson and I saw the connection between him and Lewis and I wanted Peterson to read Lewis's book, Miracles. And I thought, well, I'm just going to send him a copy. And then I thought, he's never going to see that copy. I mean, people are going to send him hundreds of books. And then I went to an event where Peterson, in fact, um, there was a big pile of books and things next to him because everybody listens to Peterson. Here, read this book. Um, And so I thought, no, that'll never go anywhere. I should just make videos. And so that's what I've been doing. I've been making videos and it's been a, it's been a glorious little thing, but anyway, so part of my thesis in terms of, you know, talking with John Verveke quite a bit and Jonathan Peugeot and Sam and all of the other people in, in this little corner of the internet has been part of my thinking behind, let's say the deep motivation against attitudes of telos is in fact in some ways in the West the 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 defense a defense of a good God. In, in a way, we deny God's existence to defend His goodness. Now that sounds crazy, but it isn't crazy when you watch people deconstruct when they in fact simultaneously deny the goodness of God and deny his existence. And so I think in some ways, quite understandably, people like Brett and John look at the world and say, look at the, look at the, look at the, the fields of death and emptiness that, that an imagined good God would use in order to construct our present reality. Certainly when we create we don't leave as much waste as the eons of evolutionary death and time that the creator God did. 
And then, of course, many Christians will wait and say, no, it was ex nihilo, you know, giraffe, uh, elephant, um, all of these things. Pay no attention to the to the fossils underneath the dirt. So I mean, this this conversation has been going on for not a very long time, evolutionary speaking, but a significant amount of time in the West. And I don't I've I've only listened to this. I've only played this video twice, and so I haven't really thought through Sam's take here. Now, John doesn't like it so much, but I want to play it because Sam's just got a little YouTube channel, and not a lot of you will see it, but I thought it was a very interesting argument that Sam lays out. Sam's a really smart guy. You know, one of these days, he'll believe in the Trinity. <laughs> so so here's here's why I might push back on that a little bit. Please, so, please. so there's, you know, there's a couple different ways, I think, to talk about sort of purpose in biology and evolution, right? So like the purpose of a polar bear is to hunt seals in the Arctic, right? Yes, and yes. so they are white because so that they can sneak up on seals. The purpose of their yeah. whiteness is so that they're harder to distinguish from the snow around them so that yeah. it, the, sneal, the seals can't see them as easily, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, and they're big and fluffy because it's cold. Right. And, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's there's purpose in all the sorts of aspects of uh, of a polar bear. Now, now, it's interesting that Brett always uses this language and, and because there's no other language to use. And, and John Verveke makes that point again and again because John, of course, uses this language and John understands the the conflicts with using this language. Just go ahead and watch Awakening from the Meaning Crisis because there's no other language to use. And But if there's no other language to use, what does that say about our capacity to frame these things in terms of the mental models that we have to carry around with us? That are sort of, you know, all centered on their purpose, which is, you know, hunting seals, but you know, the polar bear isn't aware of its own whiteness, probably not, as right. the, the reason why it's white. You know, it, it knows to, you know, when they're sneaking up on seals, they cover their nose, right, with their paws <laughs> because their nose is black. But they probably don't know why they do that sort of thing, right? Um, it, it's like at the level of instinct. So they're, well, I'm sure there's, you know, polar bears are probably, you know, more, well, they, they have some level of cognition and, and that sort of thing. But there, there are purposes that are not in their own mind that they're acting out. And I, I don't think that you would disagree with any of that. Um, but I, I feel like it's almost like the theory, the, the process of evolution, the mechanism of evolution, the ability to encode a form right in sort of, you know, DNA and that sort of thing. And then to translate that into a form into, you know, there's the DNA yeah. of a polar bear, which yeah. can get translated into an actual polar bear. And then, you know, the polar bear has more polar bear offspring if everything goes well. That, that, that mechanism of, you know, information, embodiment of information, but also the search algorithm, right? You know, each child's yeah. a little different. There's some randomness and the randomness is useful, right? The randomness is because the environment changes or we're not a perfect polar bear yet. There, there's still room for improvement in polar bearness. And, yeah. and that it's this, it's, it's almost as if the purpose of evolution is purpose itself, right? Like there are a lot, you know, there's the purpose of an owl. That's a really interesting idea. Alligator, the purpose of a beetle, the purpose of a maple tree, the purpose of all of these different things. And they have lots of different sub purposes and make their livings in lots of different ways. But it's like life itself is searching for purpose itself, I would say. And that, you know, there's nothing, the, the process of evolution isn't thinking this, right? It doesn't no. have a mind in that sense, but it is almost like it is the, the, it is the bottom up, you know, emergence of purpose itself. So, so I think that's great. And, um, and I, when I said representation, I didn't mean I didn't mean necessarily consciousness. I think paramecians have sort of internal chemical processes that track things in the environment so mm -hmm. that they, so uh, let, let's say when we talk about teleology, we're talking about agency then. Let's try, yeah. let's try a different term. Okay. All right. and, uh, so paramecium is an agent. Yeah. It's, it has, doesn't have awareness. It doesn't think. But the paramecium can, in some sense, detect the consequences of its behavior and then change its behavior Right, in order to maintain its autopoiesis. It's a self-organizing system that is self-organized so that it can detect conditions that will preserve or threaten 
It's structural mm -hmm. functional organization. And if yeah. that's what you mean by purpose, uh, yes, living things are on purpose. That, that, that's what distinguishes an autopoetic thing from a self, merely self-organizing thing. Autopoetic mm -hmm. things are self-organized such that they seek out the conditions that will promote their continued existence. So right, I right. agree with that. And I didn't mean to attribute anything. I, 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 I think I, I fumbled when I used the word foresight. That, that yeah. brings with it, and I apologize for that. What, that was careless on my part. I meant more this ability to detect forward and adjust. So I think wherever there's agency, it is, and I mean it for like... And, and I'm not sure the difference between detecting forward and adjust from foresight. Uh, again, he's trying to differentiate sort of a consciousness with versus a non-consciousness. But I think, Sam, you know, when I had my conversation with, with Brett Anderson, and I really need to get him back on the channel. There's the sense in which we are all together working out things. Working out things, that's a hard we're working out a story and and in fact stories is one of the best ways to 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 talk about it and to process it and and so when when peterson and 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 weinstein are talking about this again this is i think a, a deep part of you know why on earth did jordan peterson catch my attention three years ago three plus years ago i i think it had a lot to do with what he is working out with um, Peugeot in that conversation, but I didn't know it, but yet I acted upon it. And, and so actually I had a, um, Daniel Bonovac was in a dream of mine last night. I just remembered that, uh, Daniel Bonovac has this great video about two level theories. Well, maybe I'll just grab it a minute. This is my, this is my new PowerPoint less style of making videos, which might, you know, train wreck everything, but it's such a little train. We'll just pick it up and put it back on the track. So, well, then let's talk about the problem of normativity. That's today's topic. And so what I want to do is think about a problem that I think is a central problem throughout the 20th century. It is in part a philosophical problem, but it's not just a philosophical problem. It's really a problem that affects people's everyday lives the way they think about their lives, the way they think about themselves, the way they think about their relationship to other people and to the world. So let's take a look at what this problem is. We have to go back to the Enlightenment. The problems that are dealt with in the 20th century arise out of the Enlightenment, and in particular in the scientific revolution. There are two thoughts that emerge in the Enlightenment that sit somewhat uncomfortably together. And Enlightenment thinkers, I think, don't fully appreciate the complexity of this. But by the dawn of the 20th century, people became well aware of the tension between these two Enlightenment ideals. One of them is the gap between is and ought. That's what I'm calling this problem of normativity. What do I mean by normativity? Well, norms, the ought factor. We evaluate the world as good, bad, right, wrong, just, and unjust. We also describe the world, and there's a little bit of a tension between those two things in a traditional conception of the world, they go together very nicely. But there's something, as we'll see, about the scientific revolution that suggests, at least to some people, that science could be a complete description of the world. And once that's the case, you start thinking, well, wait, then what is left over for these evaluative judgments, the rights, wrongs, just, unjust? And, and if you watch Brett Weinstein's conversation with Sam Harris, they get hung up on it. But when I listen to both of them, you know, Sam just seems obtuse about, I think, the very valid points Brett is pointing to, but Brett seems obtuse about the main body of work and how that impinges upon his main missionary theory of saving the world. That matter, virtuous, vicious, cowardly, courageous, and so on. What is there left for that kind of language to do? What's left for the ought if we can give a complete description of the world? in science in terms of just is and must. So there's a gap between is and ought, between description and prescription, if you want to put it that way, or description and evaluation, between fact and value. And it's that gap that is going to concern us. Now, the thought really goes back to ancient times that yes, there are these two dimensions of things. I can simply describe or I can also evaluate. I can talk about the way the world is or the way the world ought to be. However, the tension between the two is something that really arises as a product of the Enlightenment. 
the second thought from the Enlightenment that is going to create the puzzle and do a lot to create the tension is the idea of a two-level theory. We're going to see a lot of two-level theories throughout this course, and so they arise for the first time, perhaps, in the Enlightenment. Um, they create a problem, as we'll see, about what it is to be human. Now, what do I mean by a two-level theory? Well, according to this sort of theory, there is a surface level of things, roughly the world as we observe it, and ourselves as we observe ourselves, and then there's a depth level, a deeper level that actually does all the explanatory work, that explains why things at the surface level behave the way they do. Now, again, what's deeply ironic is, which I, I, I saw right away when I first watched that Brett Weinstein, Jamie Wheel conversation is, okay, Brett, so you're all about the depth stuff. And, and in a sense, you're the, you're the one affording the revelation to us about the depth stuff. And the power of your preaching is that you are now revealing to us that which is underneath, that which makes the world work. You are, you are showing us the hidden code of the world. But then in your salvation story, poof, you just deny the code because you somehow instantly know what's good. And, you know, to me that brought out oh, is the, oh, here's, here's the book because that instantly brings out, I'm going to make sure it's, that instantly brings out soul searching, Christian Smith, his work, because he surveys American youth and tries to find out from whence does normativity come? They all kind of innocently say, because he's talking to teenagers, well, my parents, okay, good, your parents, good. Um, but, and then they basically say, well, morality is just self-evident. It's just obvious what is good. Well, I really need to get Tom Holland's book, Dominion, because, well, it's only self-evident because you were formed that way deeper level that actually does all the explanatory work, that explains why things at the surface level behave the way they do. So a classic example is in science. We describe what's going on in a chemistry lab, for example, by talking ultimately about molecular structures. We talk about the microscopic level of things, and we say that explains what's going on at the macroscopic level, the level of appearances. That's one example of a two-level theory. As we'll see throughout the course, there are many others. There's evolutionary theory that says, aha, yes, you seem to be doing this and this, but really you're serving a certain genetic purpose. Or we'll see a variety of versions, for example, Freudian psychology. Ah, you think you're doing it for that reason, but no, 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 you're really doing it because you hate your father and wanted to sleep with your mother. <laughs> um, now, now, this leads into what was arguably one of the really most interesting points of Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein's conversation. Now, sort of in a follow-up, and if you haven't seen my <laughs> five hours of commentary on Jordan Peterson talking to Jonathan Peugeot, Peterson is, is grappling with, one of Peterson's huge arguments is that consciousness, human consciousness, has been shaping and molding us. And in many ways, human consciousness has colonized human behavior. And Brett, in sort of his two-level theory, oh, no, 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 the genes keep talking, the genes keep talking. In the first part of this video, he just keeps hammering that the genes keep talking. Any flaws in that that you see? No, I would say that there's another rung to that ladder. So uh, as an undergraduate, I worked with Trivers, um, and uh, reciprocity was obviously uh, a key feature of his contribution to the field. My graduate advisor, Dick Alexander, contributed the idea of indirect reciprocity, in which typically mediated through things like reputation, it does not mm -hmm. have to be repaid by the individual for whom you've done the service. And of course, this actually underlies the evolution of, of economic systems and, and, and the like. Now, now, that's really interesting, because, you know, Brett also has this language around metaphorical truth, and he always says literal truth. And what he should be saying is figure is a physical truth, because once you use that word literal, you're sort of pushing yourself into a language game where if you really want to stay in your scientific frame, you should probably say physical truth. But, but again, once in a sense you have to start dealing with reputation, well, what are we dealing with? Let's map out. I have to get back to um, 
Jonathan's brother's book at one of the, uh, in one of these days. But you're starting to map out the the you're starting to map out heaven and earth. And again, way back when you can find a video where Brett and Jordan and Jonathan Peugeot are at a conference in the Seattle area, and Peugeot tags Brett on you can't use that word higher, and and well. And, and that's a conversation I'd really love to see Jonathan and Brett continue because I think Jonathan has him nailed there because Brett just sort of keeps fudging with with his words in these games. And, you know, you're a scientist. You know, stop fudging with the language. Um, but I want to go back to the question you asked me about um, whether or not the genes are not, in fact, in some ways subject to the the consciousness subject to is a good word uh, the the consciousness is colonizing and and you know john verveke when i first started making videos says why are you using that word well i get it from lewis in his book miracles and colonizing is exactly the right word because what a what an imperialist does is is mobilize the assets of their inferiors in order to benefit the superior it's not exactly I, I want to make a video on the difference between colonizing and parasiting, okay? But colonizing is exactly the right idea. So it's subject to. In fact, in some ways, subject to the, the consciousness. There is a limited way in which that is true. Clearly, the genes are exist in an environment in which the consciousness has a great deal of say over what the genes get to do. But here's the problem. Let's take it away from people for a second so that we can see this clearly. The genes of a spider exist in all of the spider's cells, incapable of doing anything, exerting any force on the world whatsoever, except through the spider. Uh, I'm going to have to adjust the sound because videos are different. So you might say that actually... The body of the spider is in some ways in charge of the gene's well-being. And that's true. But if it's, is that metaphorically true? See, this is, and again, with previous past videos with Brett, I keep bringing him back to C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, because his distinction between physically true and metaphorically true always breaks down when you come to language, because you can't pierce that level without metaphor all language is metaphorical and so you're sort of caught in a trap in this that that in some ways it would be helpful if brett would own because he just keeps sort of sliding over the line if you had a group of spiders that woke up to the fact that their bodies were in fact in charge and that their genes couldn't force them to do anything and those spiders decided instead of in investing in spider ecology stuff, they were going to invest in um, uh, spider hedonism, right? Something like that. So that the spiders were just doing what their bodies felt like doing and not what their genes wanted them doing, which is to spread those genes. Um, then those individual spiders would indeed be in control. They could do exactly what they wanted. But what would happen is those spiders that made that decision would fail to pass on their genes. And two spider generations later, they would be gone. And the right. spiders Ab that we- Well, I, I, would, I would certainly, I'm thinking of a bi-directional effect, obviously. And, and when Peterson says that, I mean, Verveke stuff is all over this because that is, I mean, if there's one thing Verveke is trying to do is, you know, okay, well now it's bi-directional. And I see, I see this as part of the ongoing evolution away from naturalism. And it's, it's happening as we watch. But it doesn't happen just like this. People don't, Vander Clay just doesn't come on YouTube and say, I don't believe Jesus died for my sins. You know, it, it, we don't, people don't evolve that way. People don't deconstruct that way. People don't change that way. But we're seeing this bi-directionality cropping up. We've seen in Verveke, we're seeing in Peterson. And again, when Daniel Dennett was on Unbelievable and he said, I believe there's matter and information. And I thought, Aristotle wins. I mean, it's clear, I think you're absolutely right, that consciousness can make decisions that are going to put genetic evolution to a halt. So, uh, but, we, but, uh, what but, I'm saying, actually, is that we must do that if we are to survive 
but it is, I believe it is the most difficult puzzle human beings have ever faced. We have to reverse, we have to turn the tables on the genes, and we have to actually say, look, we have to confront the genes. The genes awarded... When he talks this way, again, I have listened to hours of him with appreciation talking about what we are doing because of our programming. And now we are somehow no longer bound to our programming. Because as it stands now, in terms of, and this is the point, I mean, I had this conversation with Jonathan, John Verveke about, you know, is this a matter of kind or degree? In terms of kind, aren't we the spiders he just talked about? That is the entire premise of naturalism. We are in kind the spiders. We are not in kind different from the apes. But he is pleading with us that we not be what every other time he talks about says we are. That's what he's saying. I would pull my hair out if I had any. <laughs> because the entire fight over the religious fight over human evolution was a question about kind or degree. And the naturalist argument is we are only a difference from the animal kingdom in degree not kind. It's a theological argument. And every time Brett makes this religious appeal, he undercuts his naturalism. And he doesn't see it. Us, the most amazing computational machinery in the known universe. They also awarded us um, the ability to pursue and appreciate beauty, to be compassionate. They awarded us all of those things as a means to a narrow genetic end, a very uninteresting one. And the point is, now that we have consciousness and we do appreciate beauty and we can be compassionate and we appreciate people who have good characteristics, we have to look at what we're programmed for and say, actually, no, the machine is capable of something honorable, whereas the genetic objective is... Honorable! From whence do you describe, do you, de you do, do you derive by your first principles? He loves to talk about first principle arguing. What first principle do you find from honorable? And again, I, I guess I've got to order a physical copy of Tom Holland's book because I want to put it on the screen and say... You're just smuggling Christian values here. Jewish values too. I'm not trying to make it an ethnic thing. You're just smuggling it. Actually, 100% identical to the genetic objective of every other creature with genes. That is to say, the capacity of a human being is spectacular. It is unrivaled. But the purpose of a human being is no different than the purpose of a liver fluke or an oak tree or a malaria particle. It's... So we are, we are of a kind with the liver fluke and the malaria particle, but we have a capacity that that little spider doesn't have. To pass on its genes. And given that we can now see that we don't want to be advancing our genetic interests, because frankly, that's not a defensible goal. But we well, then what is us? You have a career out of telling us we are only our genes. And now you say we need to be more than our genes. Where is that moreness coming from? We do honor the things that our machine is capable of. We have to place those things at a higher position in the hierarchy. And I have to find that clip. I would say it doesn't supersede with respect to the truth claim. It supersedes with respect to considerations of behavior and policy. So I absolutely agree with you. There are plenty of scientific truths that are deeply unfortunate. And I'm, I want to take what you said, the first thing that you said. Okay. If you're good, you die and you go to heaven. If you're good, you die and you're reincarnated as a higher being. Those two things are the same. Okay, in terms of their effect. 
there, our restating of the hierarchy. The hierarchy, religion is all about the hierarchy. That's what religion is about. The, the restating of the hierarchy in those two terms have the same effect in terms of what we're saying, is that if you're good, you will not meld those two things together. And that is the hierarchy. The hierarchy itself is the capacity to be above quantitative, uh, purely quantitative considerations. Uh, uh, considerations and to apply qualitative thinking. And the whole language of hierarchy is all a language about a movement from, from quantity up to quality. Like the, it's, it's movement, it's a, going up a mountain, it's going up the base and then going up to, un, to unity. And when you stand in that top place, then you can look down and you can judge what facts, because there is, there are, there is an, an innumerable amounts of facts, there's an infinite quantity of facts, you can decide which facts are worth pursuing. And so that's what religion is, and that's what the hierarchy is. And so if you take a, if you take qualitative, if you take a, a quantitative tidbit of information, and you say that is above, let's say, qualitative judgment, how do you even, why, why are you even focusing on that quantitative uh, data? Because there's, there's an infinite amount of them. So you have to have a, ma a manner by which you focus on something. And that is the hierarchy, and that is the whole language of, of the religious hierarchy. So, yeah. so what do you do where religious traditions and what I'm calling metaphorical truths conflict? So let's say mating systems. I would argue that monogamy is a superior mating system because it does not sideline any significant population of males. If you sideline a significant population of males by having uh, what biologists would call a polygynous system or people would generally call a polygamous system, if you do that, then you have sexually frustrated males who are left over and inevitably become something like a marauding horde or an army or something immoral like that. Now, wait, wait. Now, you're assuming that's bad. Yes. And so you're falling into Jonathan's trap. Because you're saying, you see, you have this a priori framework that monogamy is better because you've already decided what constitutes bad. You can't help but lay a moral framework over your selection of facts. And so that, I mean, I'm not trying to trap you. I know this is a crazily complicated problem. Yeah. But, but the idea that you, that, that the fundamental idea is that you can't select the damn facts and order them, which you have to do, you have to do it, without applying an a priori moral framework. Right, so I would say I am applying an a priori moral framework. I am not treating this as, a, I mean, you, you know, we could also look at the behavior of people as a physical process. It's equally a physical process as it is a moral behavioral process. I'm not doing that. I'm being a human being, and I'm saying from the point of view of values that probably everybody in this room would share, it is not desirable to have sexually frustrated young men roving around being violent because they can't find a mate because some other highly placed males in the society have many mates. That's Unless you're maybe Russia and you want to destroy America. I'm not saying they're doing that. I'm just saying you wouldn't want this to happen. You're the guy that talks about assassin robots. <laughs> I can't. I watch him in these things and I think, you are a brilliant man. You are a brilliant man. This seems, and we're all, we've all got our blind spots, you know. Another, another person I, I have to mention in this is Sevilla. I mean, Poor Sevilla has been out there in the wilderness of YouTube tr making these points forever and ever and ever and ever and ever following Persig and and Zen and the or or Motorcycle Maintenance and, and, and Lila. And just, you know, I, I haven't yet watched her, her commentary on, on Peterson and Peugeot, but er when I was watching that commentary on Peterson and Peugeot, I couldn't just help but think about Sevilla because... There it is. It's the fact value distinction. And you, you just simply don't get away from it. Well, I am out of time right now. 
And that is just the nature of me as a YouTuber. I have limited amounts of time to make these little videos and put them out there. So I do very much want to. I will probably return because there's some excellent sections in the Peterson, in the Peterson, Brett Weinstein conversation. There's some. In fact, there's an there's another section that comes out that Peterson says something that is just just blew me away and I'm going to have to make a clip of it because I really have to recharge my clip channel and I just don't want to, it's it's, it's all complicated stuff. Again, basically, why do I do YouTube? I do YouTube partly just to record my own ideas, to share them with you, to get the conversation going with you. Um, It's the same reason I blogged before. I always blog to just get ideas out there and why not share my ideas and my, the things that I find and my stories publicly. So that's what I do. But anyway, I, I can't help but not see Brett as a Gnostic who, who, who doesn't know he's a Gnostic. And I don't know where he goes if, and, and this is this is part of the challenge of us human beings, we, we hold on doggedly to our ideas because if we lose our ideas, we lose ourselves. And, and again, what sense does this make in terms of understanding us fundamentally as biological genetic creatures? Modernism is going away. And, and in some ways, both, both Jordan and Brett are you know, late stage modernists, but I see Jordan as, you know, as, as John, Jonathan said, he's, he's on, he's got feet on two islands and, and in some ways, both Brett and Jordan are trying to, Hey, we don't want to lose science. And in the way, same way that I understand early modern theologians, like we don't want to lose the Bible. And so they have all this, this modernist ways, which sort of didn't cut it. So anyway, um, Watch the video. I'll, I'm sure I'll have more to say about this video and hopefully be able to integrate some of this conversation with, with Peterson's conversation with Brett because I really want to see Jordan and Brett and, and Jonathan talk together. So Jordan, you can make that happen. So please do it.